Good morning. Today we have uh, various things that, that we need to take care of. Finishing up our discussion of symmetry and bonding. We're mostly done talking about it, but we do need to talk about how we figure out if various integrals go to zero in a particular space or in a particular point group. And then we're going to talk about some terminology that we need to get into rotational spectroscopy. And maybe we'll get to talking about quantization of angular momentum. So I hope to be done with rotational spectroscopy by the end of Friday's lecture so that we can start vibrational spectroscopy next week. Let's see how that goes. OK, so just to follow up on the discussion last time, we were looking at these bonding examples and seeing which orbitals can form sigma bonds and pi bonds. And I asked you to you know, go through and reduce our reducible representations that we came up with in class and make sure that you get the right answer. And I just want to follow up on that to make sure everyone gets it. OK, so here was what we got. So we had our representation of the pi bonds. We know that they have to be perpendicular to the sigma bonds, which was the only condition that, that we started with. And so we had to consider the in-plane set and the out-of-plane set. And by making our reducible representations based on the symmetry of those objects and reducing them, we came up with the following combinations of <coughs> irreducible representations. So for the out-of-plane set, we came up with A double prime and E double prime. And for the in-plane set, <clears throat> we came up with A2 prime and E prime. And if we go and look at the character table and look at what objects belong to these particular irreducible representations, we see that um, we've got a PZ orbital belonging to the out-of-plane set. The in-plane set has one symmetry species that doesn't correspond to any orbital. And then the other one contains the x and y orbitals and then also some d orbitals. So what we know from this is that uh, px and py wouldn't make any sense because they're already involved in the sigma bond. We know that the pi bond has to be perpendicular. And we also know that d orbitals are not realistically going to be involved in a, in a nitrogen compound. That's, that's what we were talking about. So they're energetically not available. And so we know that the PZ orbital on that, uh, on that central nitrogen and also the, the oxygens is what's involved in the pi bond, which again is something that we already knew. So it's useful to do these bonding examples when we're learning these things for a couple of reasons. One is because you don't need me to make up practice examples. You can go through sort of all the random Lewis structure examples from general chemistry and do problems like this. There's really a limited number of point groups that have few enough symmetry species that you could realistically be expected to do this in class. So if you do a few of those and a few of the ones that are harder, you can really get a good handle on this. And you can check your answer yourself, because you know, in the case of the, these bonding examples, what you should get. And it should be consistent with, with uh, your chemical knowledge. OK, so we also had a bonding example in the homework where we wanted to do the same kind of analysis for oxalate. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I just wanted to give you a couple hints in case you're having trouble getting started. So first of all, here's your basis. You can draw little arrows representing the carbon-oxygen bonds. And why did I not represent any single and double bonds here? Anybody know? I know you do, because people talked about it in office hours. Are they all the same? Yes, right? It has resonance structures. And so we need to make sure to take that into account. So we assign it to a point group. We know our basis. There are four things in our basis. And so we know that the character of the identity matrix is going to be 0. And then if we do 
the, um, let's just do one example of setting up a, a matrix. So if we do a C2 rotation in the y direction, so, so remember the way this is set up, the molecules in the xy plane and z is coming out at you. So if we rotate about the y axis, here's what we get. We're just flipping it over this way. And we need to come up with the matrix that gives us that when we multiply it by the original vector. So A1 switches places with A2 and A3 switches places with A4. So there's the matrix that we get for that. And the character for that operation is zero. So this is the kind of stuff that you should be able to do. And it's, uh, it's useful to practice. Um, you know, w when you come to office hours, we can do more examples like this. Again, you can make them up yourself and, and do them. Make sure that you get it. OK, so that concludes our discussion of, uh, of bonding. I'm not going to go the rest of the way through this. I just wanted to give you a hint. Let's talk about it in a little bit more general way, because we're going to need these sort of symmetry arguments when we start talking about spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is all about the interaction of, of light and matter. And we're going to have different kinds of states that the molecule can be in. First, we're going to talk about rotational states, but then vibrational states, electronic states, <coughs> nuclear spin states. And we're going to have selection rules where, we, where, where we'll see that only certain transitions are allowed. And the reason that happens is because of these symmetry arguments. So we need to, uh, to be able to, to do one more thing with these symmetry sorts of things. So one thing that I'm sure you're familiar with or at least have seen before in, in calculus, some other math classes, is just the even odd rule. So if we have even functions, they're symmetric over a, a symmetric interval. Odd functions are anti-symmetric. So if you integrate an even function over a symmetric integral, you get some number. If you integrate an odd function over a symmetric interval, you always get zero. And this is a nice thing to remember because it means that there are integrals that could look pretty nasty and you can just say they go to zero by inspection. Of course, if they don't, then you have to work it out. But um, that's a trick that mean professors like to pull to sear that into your frontal lobes, you know, put some really horrible looking thing on an exam and you know, then if you remember this, this rule, you can see that it just goes to zero. We're going to look at how to use this in a little bit more general way with uh, symmetry groups. So just here's some more examples. If we want to multiply these functions together, if you multiply two even or two odd functions, you get an even function. If you multiply an even times an odd, you get an odd function. We can also look at how their derivatives work. If you take the first derivative of an even function, you get an odd function and vice versa. And again, if we go back to our general chemistry intuition, this is something that we all understand at a really intuitive level. So if we talk about molecular orbitals, let's just do a really simple case, H2. If we have our two s orbitals in phase, they add constructively and we get a bonding molecular orbital. And if they're out of phase, they interfere destructively. There's a node in the middle, and we get an antibonding molecular orbital. And again, this is, this is something that we all remember. So we can look at this in a little bit more systematic way. We can talk about you know, if we have an s orbital and a px orbital, you know, assuming that we get it oriented the right way, there's non-zero overlap. But if we look at something like an s orbital with a pz orbital in this coordinate system, in this orientation, we have a, a situation where lobes of opposite signs cancel. And if we have an integral like this, where we have the product of two functions and we're integrating it over some uh, symmetric interval here, all space. We can find the symmetry species of each function in whatever point group we're in. Then we want to multiply them together, and that will give us a reducible representation. And when we reduce it, 
we have to look at it and see if it contains an A1. And if it doesn't, then there's no overlap. So let's think about what that means. A1, remember, is the symmetry species that is invariant with respect to all transformations. It has a character of one under every operation. And what that means is that if I have, say, a chemical bond and my orbitals overlap, that has to be invariant to all operations. If that wasn't true, my chemical bond would appear and, and disappear when I rotate the molecule, for example, and that wouldn't make any sense. So that's, that's uh, how you can understand how this works. So let's look at some pretty simple examples. So if we look at a molecule like ammonia, and if we want to know whether there's overlap of the s orbital on the nitrogen with this particular linear combination of s orbitals on the three hydrogens, we can do that the same way. So again, this doesn't tell you that whether that's the only thing going on. Obviously, we know it's not. There are p orbitals involved also. We just want a yes or no answer. Do these things overlap? Another thing I want to point out is that just because you can make particular linear combinations of orbitals doesn't mean that that's the ground state or that that's necessarily what's going on in a given system. This is important because particularly when we look at electronic spectroscopy, we are going to see excited states and things that look pretty weird, but we have to worry about them because we're putting in energy and kicking the electrons up there. So again, this is just telling us it's, it's, a, it's powerful, but it's limited in what it can give us. We get a yes or no answer as to whether these things have any overlap, and that's, that's about it, but it is useful. Okay, so we just go through and do this by inspection. So F1 is our s orbital on the nitrogen, and it's a sphere, so it's going to have, it's going to be invariant under all these transformations. Then if we look at the, um, the linear combination that we have of the three hydrogen orbitals all in phase with each other, we have to actually look at that and see what it does. Of course, we know it's invariant under the identity because everything is. For C3, we do get something that, uh, that looks the same. It doesn't change sign. And for sigma v, we, we get something that, uh, that looks the same. And then if we multiply all these characters together, we do get something that looks like A1, and so it has overlap. So we know that there can be some interaction between these, this s orbital on the nitrogen and this particular linear combination. So now let's look at another one that, uh, that has uh, a different sort of symmetry. So we've got this, this s orbital on the nitrogen again, and now we have a linear combination that consists of two of the three s orbitals of the hydrogens out of phase with each other. So, you know, again, does this look like a realistic orbital that we usually talk about in terms of bonding? Not really, but we can make linear combinations like this. And when we get into excited states, we will see some things that, that, uh, that look kind of weird. OK, so again, we know what happens with the s orbital. It's invariant under all transformations. The second linear combination, it, uh, it has a character of 2 for the identity. And then for C3, we get an overall character of minus 1. And for sigma v, we get an overall character of 0. And then if we multiply these together and reduce it, we get the symmetry species of E. And there's no A1 in that, so there's no overlap. And I think um, we're going to come back and talk about this later. I just want to introduce it so that we get a, a feel for how it works. And when we start talking about um, selection rules, we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So for now, the most important thing to remember is the even-odd rule and also you know, how you go through this general procedure. Question? Uh, Professor, going back to your previous slide, when mm -hmm. you have um, F3 with the three different um, 
hydrogen orbitals as orbitals, aren't they all different? In that case, for the C3V under F3, should the identity operation is equal to 3? Um, yeah, I took a shortcut and ended up reducing this. Why don't I write up a little um, description of, of this with more steps in it and post it for you guys? That might be a, that, that might be a useful thing to do. You're right, I, I did skip some steps. Okay, so now we're moving on and um, we're, getting, we're gonna get to Dirac notation. Have you seen Dirac notation before? Is this something that, that came up last quarter? Okay, it's something that's really important to be able to read the literature in quantum mechanics. A lot of things are written down this way. And it takes a little bit of getting used to it first, but it's just a shorthand notation for writing down wave functions and writing down integrals. And it just saves a lot of time. So we're going to see a lot of cases where we have a lot of complex integrals. We're, we're integrating wave functions together. And everybody knows what the function is. We don't need to keep writing it down over and over again. This is just an easy way to write it. it it is a very compact notation, and it contains a lot of information, and you need to know what's, our, what's going on in order to be able to use it. So we have to be careful not to make mistakes and, and make sure that, that everybody knows what's, uh, what's in there. But once you get the hang of it, it's really useful and saves a lot of time. Okay, so if we have a normalization, and I know that you have seen this and, and you know what that's about, that's just an integral of the complex conjugate of uh, one wave function with some other wave function over all space. And we know what you get here. So that equals one if n prime equals n, so if your two wave functions are the same, and it equals zero otherwise. And that's just a consequence of the fact that these things are orthonormal sets. Okay, so in Dirac notation, this is how we write down that integral. It's just a shorter way to do it. So this uh, funny little front half of the bracket thing is called a bra, and the other one is called a ket. And so Dirac notation is also called bra ket notation. And if you just have a ket, Yes, let's all have a middle school moment and giggle at the bra. That's fine. <laughs> I, I can see people trying to hold it back. There's, there's no point. We might as well just give in. All right. Um, the, so, so when you see a bra by itself, that's just the complex conjugate of a wave function. That's, that's all it means. The ket by itself is a wave function. When you see them together like this, that means take the integral of that over all space. So there is an integration implied in that operation. And then we can also write down this condition for what you get in a different way as the Kronecker delta function. Did you see this last quarter? Not really? OK. You did, it, because everybody looked uh, happy and looked like it was familiar when I talked about the normalization condition, where it equals 1 if the wave functions are the same and 0 if they're different. That's all this is. The Kronecker delta function is just a, a compact way of writing that down. So when you see delta sub n n prime, that's, that's a function. I mean, it's, it's a function kind of. It's just, you know, it's just telling you that that equals 1 if they're the same and 0 if they're not. OK, so now we can go through and talk about how to do some other things. So here's, here's how we write down our normalization. And you know, I'm saying it's a shorthand notation and it saves space. It doesn't look like it saves that much space right now, but imagine that we have to put in what the actual wave functions are and it's a big mess. Whereas if we, we can just, if we use the Brockett notation, as long as we're in a specified system, we know what the eigenfunctions are, we can just specify them with their quantum numbers, for example. Okay, so let's look at a matrix element. So I want to write down a matrix element of some operator, which I'm calling omega. So we know that quantum mechanical operators are, are uh, they're linear operators. We can represent them with matrices. 
And the matrix element Nm for omega is just this integral. And here's how we go about writing that down. And so if we wanted to make a whole matrix for our representation of omega, we would just have to go through and uh, set up all of our matrix elements. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? It's really important and it's going to keep coming up over and over again and I'm not going to write out all the wave functions every time so you're definitely going to see it. Yes? Yeah, so what, what exactly shows that it's an integral? Like the brackets it means it's an integral and what's inside it means? Okay, so if you just have like, so, so n prime in the, the bracket that it's in, that's a ket. Okay. That's just the wave function. <laughs> The other one that's the bra, that's complex conjugate of n. So there's a lot in here. So the, the n and n prime are the quantum numbers that represent that particular wave function. So you have to know what system you're in. So if you say it's a particle in the box, then we're talking about the particle in the box wave functions. And you have to know what the, the one for n equals 0 or n equals 1 or n equals 2 is. And you have to already know that the system that you're working in and what the wave functions are have to be specified. But once you know that, this is a shorthand way of writing them down. Then when you get the bra and the ket together like that, that's when it, that's when it implies an integration over all space. Yeah, my question is, what, like, what does the line in the middle mean? Um, like, does that, does that mean? What does the line in the middle mean? There's, so there's... <laughs> It, okay, so if you look at the, the picture in the, in, the, uh, in, in the bottom right of the matrix element, so the, the M in that bracket is a ket, and then the other thing is a bra. And so imagine, you know, take the omega out of the middle, you're putting them together. The, you know, line that's on one part of the bra and the one that's on the other part of the ket are superimposed on top of each other. That's all it is. You're just, you're just sandwiching them next to each other. And then when we put the operator in between, that means that we operate omega on M first. Remember, remember the order of operations for these things. We operate the omega on M and then we take the integral of whatever the result of that is with the complex conjugate of N over all space. Does that help? Yes. Any more questions? If, if you don't understand, please do ask now because it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up a lot. Yes? So you said uh, when you put them together in the broad education, it's over all space, like negative infinity to infinity. Well, it depends on the context of what you're doing, right? So again, we have to know, we have to know what the system is. So if you have a harmonic oscillator that's in a, a particular potential, it's over the space of, of that system. And you know, it's, this is really powerful because it's very general. When we start to talk about NMR spectroscopy, which we're going to, then we'll be talking about things in spin space. It's not even in space, it's not even in real physical space. It'll be in, in spin space, which, which we'll learn about later. So it's extremely general, and this is used for writing down all kinds of things in physics and chemistry. And you know, again, it's, it's, not, it's, it's just notation but you will see it all over the place if you want to go read the literature in quantum chemistry or physics and it is going to come up a lot. So your book mostly doesn't use it. There's a little section um, somewhere in the early chapters on how to do it as kind of an aside. It's, it's probably useful to go look it up and, and read it if, if you want some extra uh, clarification on it. The Wikipedia page on this is really good. I also recommend looking at that. But for the most part, your book doesn't use it. They just write out all the integrals. So there will have to be some translating back and forth because I'm going to use it in class. You'll see it in the literature. And uh, your book mostly does not do it. OK, so let's move on. Oh, sorry, one more question. Delta notation mm -hmm. or the omega delta? So in, the, in that case, there's, um, there was no 
omega. That was just, I integrated the complex conjugate of n with n prime over all space. And the answer that I got is the Kronecker delta, which just means one if they're the same, zero if they're different. I did two different things with the notation. The first thing I did was I just set up a normalization condition. Then the second thing was an example of a matrix element for omega. They're, they're separate issues. Make sense? OK. We'll see lots more of this. I just want to introduce it at the beginning. OK, so now we're ready to really start talking about spectroscopy. And what, what we're going to do here is we're just going to go through the different types of spectroscopy that, uh, that there are that we can use to solve chemical and, and physical problems. And I wanted to put up this kind of big picture view of what spectroscopy is all about. So in the most general sense, it's about the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with atoms and molecules. And we can use this interaction to probe all sorts of properties that we want to learn about the, the molecules. And we're going to go roughly in general, in, in order of things that go from lowest energy to highest energy. And so this is an energy level diagram showing, you know, not really to scale, but hopefully it gives you the idea how much energy it takes to do different things with a molecule. So we have the um, electronic transitions. So we have these two uh, potentials here for the electronic transitions. And of course, the, the ground state is the bottom one. And this blue arrow is showing the system absorbing a photon and jumping up to the next excited state. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about fluorescence or you know, absorption spectroscopy when you do that in the lab and measure the optical density of something. You know, we're, we're talking about you know, just absorption here. Um, it takes a lot of energy to perform these electronic transitions. So this usually happens in either the uh, visible region or in the UV. And if we don't have enough energy to uh, excite that, we can excite vibrational or rotational transitions. And all of these things tell us different things about the molecule. So I should back up a little bit and point out that I'm going to tell you the, the quantum numbers that belong to these different things. So for electronic states, the quantum number we're usually going to use is epsilon. And then if we look at vibrational transitions, so now we're confined to the ground state of the electronic transition because now we're just putting in infrared radiation. We don't have enough energy to excite those electronic transitions. And that little red arrow from the ground state to the, the next excited state within that well is a vibrational transition. And that happens in the infrared. And the quantum number that we use for that is nu. So don't get confused. It's not a V. It's not the frequency. You know, nu gets used for a lot of things. But we have to pay attention to context. For rotational transitions, which are these little tiny ones in between the vibrational transitions, that's, those happen in the microwave. And we use the quantum number J. So again, this is a mixture of just terminology, you know, what are we going to call these things, and also looking at the big picture on a single energy scale. To, and, and this will give, give us a feel, hopefully, for why we see certain things in certain kinds of spectra. So for instance, when we do vibrational spectroscopy, we're going to see a whole bunch of fine structure that comes about from the rotations. Because vibrations take a lot more energy to excite than rotations. So when we excite something to an excited vibrational state, we get a bunch of rotational excitation for free. Same thing when we excite electronic transitions, we're going to see fine structure due to the vibrational transitions. But it doesn't go the other way. If you're just putting in microwaves, you don't have enough energy to excite a vibrational transition, and so you don't see it. And so um, 
one aside here is, uh, you know, your friends and relatives who tell you that a microwave oven works by exciting the, the uh, vibrational frequencies of water. What do you think about that at this point? Not enough energy, right? So microwaves just excite rotational transitions, and you need IR to, to excite those vibrational transitions. So your microwave works by having an electric field that's oscillating and moving the, the uh, dipoles around. OK, so as a general matter, when we go to record a spectrum that's going to tell us something about a molecule, we're going to sweep through a range of frequencies and measure the signal. So this is I of nu. And this nu really is the frequency. And we're going to plot it as a function of frequency. So who here has actually taken a spectrum of a molecule yourself of any kind? Should be almost everybody, right? Don't you do this in, in, uh, in general chemistry? Um, have you, so have you taken an absorption spectrum? Raise your hand if you, if you have Beer's Law. OK, good. How about IR? Do you do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, NMR, have you done that yourself? OK, good. So, so you have some experience with all of these things. So one of the things that you probably know is that at least in NMR and fancy IR spectroscopy, this description of you vary the frequency and you sweep through and see the response isn't 100% correct. There's other, uh, you can do it that way, but it's not the only way to do it. And we will uh, talk about what happens in these modern instruments. But OK, so here's another view of the same kind of thing. What energy range does stuff happen in? So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. And it turns out people are pretty clever at uh, making use of electromagnetic radiation and its, and its interaction with molecules. We can use just about every part of the, the spectrum to learn something about uh, things that we're interested in. So if we talk about radio frequency, that is the resonant frequency of nuclear spins. So NMR spectroscopy is down here. We will talk about it later. Then once we get into the microwave, that's where we excite rotational transitions. IR is uh, where we look at vibrations. UV vis spectroscopy is where we can excite transitions of the valence electrons. So this is what we're usually looking at in the little spectrophotometers in molecular biology labs. When we, and when we investigate Beer's law, that's what's going on here. We're looking at transitions of valence electrons. If you want to look at core electrons and, for instance, find out what atoms are present on a surface, then you need x-rays. So x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy can be used for that. So we need higher energy to excite those more tightly bound core electrons. This starts to get a little bit exotic. You need a big x-ray source. This is something that you would do at maybe a synchrotron, you know, a source that's at a big national lab. It's not an instrument that people would typically have uh, sitting around in a lab. These other things are. And then the last one, the uh, gamma rays, this also sounds pretty exotic, right? This is, uh, we can actually look at excitations of nuclear states. It's called Mussbauer spectroscopy, and that's done with gamma rays. So we will go through many of these types of spectroscopy, not all. We're not going to talk about um, XPS or Mussbauer spectroscopy so much, but the others we will go through and, and give you a feel for how it works. Some of these things are things that you're very likely to use in your research. In order to talk about the, the mechanics of how spectroscopy works and start really getting into it, we need to talk about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And I know that you've seen this last quarter, but let's just review it quickly because you know maybe it'll, it'll be put in a, a little bit more practical context. So the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation just says that the electrons move around a lot faster than the nuclei. And that means that we can separate them, which is really good because we would have very ugly problems if, uh, if that didn't work. 
And of course, it doesn't, it's not a good approximation in all cases. But for many of the things that, that we want to do as chemists, it is a good approximation. And so what that tells us is that the, you know, we have some overall wave function for the molecule. And it involves the motions of the electrons and the nuclei. And we can separate variables and treat them separately. Just because the electrons are tiny, they're moving around really fast, the nuclei are big and heavy, it takes them longer to catch up. <coughs> so the electronic wave function does depend on the positions of the nuclei, which we know. We've been talking about molecular orbitals and things like that, you know, where the electrons are, are around in, in bonds. So it's not that it has nothing to do with the nuclei at all. The positions are important. But their motion isn't really important on the time scale of the electrons under this approximation, which is usually pretty good. So we can consider that the nuclei are just sitting still on the time scale where we're worried about the electrons. And so here's our Schrodinger equation for the electrons. So we've got our Hamiltonian and our wave function. And now notice these have a subscript of epsilon to indicate that we're talking about the electronic states. That's its quantum number. And this is a function of the electron coordinates and the nuclear coordinates. But the nuclear coordinates we're going to be treating as fixed. And then when we go to talk about the nuclear motion, and this is rotation and vibration, that just sees an overall smeared out potential from the motion of the electrons. It sees the average of what the electrons are doing. <laughs> And so here we have our Hamiltonian for the nuclear transitions. And it's got subscripts of nu and j. Remember, those are our quantum numbers for vibrations and rotations. And those just depend on the nuclear coordinates, because it's just seeing some overall smeared out potential from the electrons. So again, this is a really useful approximation because it means that for the most part, we can treat our electronic spectroscopy as being separate from rotations and vibrations under many conditions. OK, so that is it for the kind of um, you know, basics and housekeeping kind of stuff and review. Let's move on to actually talking about quantization of rotation, angular momentum, things like that, that we need to know for rotational spectroscopy. So I guess it's not entirely true that we're done with review. We are going to talk about some, some things that you learned last quarter, but give it a little bit of a different spin, if you like. So please review chapter three if, uh, if you don't remember it really well. And I really recommend reviewing all of this stuff from last quarter as we talk about it, just because <coughs> quantum is one of these things where, at least I found when I was learning it as a student, it's not very intuitive. And you really have to, you know, when you get more information about how it works, you really have to go back and review the basics and make sure that you understand it. And it makes more sense every time you go back and do that. So please do review it. So one of the things that came up last quarter is the case of a particle on a ring. And you might wonder why you're interested in a particle on a ring. And that's a fascinating question. One thing about basic quantum mechanics is that you can end up with a lot of uh, these examples that don't sound very practical. So you look at a particle in a box, and a particle on a ring, and a particle on a sphere, and a harmonic oscillator. Is that right? Is that, is that what you did? So why do you think that we pick these particular things? Is it because they're extremely realistic and they describe everything in chemistry and physics? Yeah, it's because those are the only things that you can solve analytically. Like anything, uh, anything more complicated than that, you need computational methods. <laughs> 
there are lots of computational methods. There's a huge field of computational chemistry where people do electronic structure calculations. There's a, a big center for that at UCI. But these simple cases where you do get things that you can solve analytically do give us some intuition about processes that we care about. So if we think about a particle on a ring, in and of itself, that's not necessarily the most exciting thing. You know, you have some particle going around. But you can also think about it as a rigid rotor. So if you picture a diatomic molecule that's just in the gas phase, it's off by itself, it's not interacting with anything. So we have the diatomic molecule and it's rotating around. If you pick a point on that molecule and follow its rotation, it looks like a particle on a ring, right? We can use the same mathematical treatment to talk about our rigid rotor. So what do I mean by a rigid rotor? That means that the bond between those two nuclei isn't flexing at all. It's not changing, it's not bending, it's, it's just rotating around. As we'll see, that's an approximation that works pretty well at low temperature, so if we're in low energy states, and you know, also it depends on the, the molecule. If we have a very stiff bond, that works better than if we have a very floppy bond, but it is an approximation that we can start out with. Okay, so we can go through angular momentum and if we're talking about a particle on a ring, we have something that's in cylindrical coordinates. That's, that's uh, sort of the natural coordinate system to use here because we have our diatomic molecule and we can say it's rotating about the z-axis in this plane, so it makes sense to do this in cylindrical coordinates. And another thing to go review and look up the Wikipedia page if you're not really up on it is how, to, is how to transform back and forth between Cartesian coordinates and cylindrical and spherical coordinates because that's something that we're going to need to know how to do. Okay, so here's, here's our angular momentum in the classical case. So we have uh, our angular momentum about z is uh, plus or minus the momentum times the radius, and we can get the uh, the moment of inertia here, and we can you know we can calculate the moment of inertia for a diatomic molecule. In the book, it goes into all the different kinds of rigid rotors that you can have that have different moments of inertia, and that's a useful thing to look at. I it's it's good to to go through it and understand how it works. It's not something we're going to spend a huge amount of time on in class because it. It boils down to a lot of crap to memorize. There are a lot of formulas, and that's not really what we're about. We want to learn how to solve problems. So in class, we're mostly going to focus on the diatomic case with the understanding that there's all this other stuff that you can do. We're going to look at the, the case where we can solve things analytically. And well, you can for some of these other things too. But anyway, it's worth going and looking at it just to make sure you understand how it works. But we're not really going to focus on it in class. All right, so if we take, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through and solve the Schrodinger equation for this for you. I assume you did that last quarter. But we'll just go through the, the argument um, for how you get this. So in the quantum version of this, we can, you know, use an analogy to the de Broglie wavelength for the, uh, the momentum here. And the fact that it has to be quantized comes from, from the, the fact that it has periodic boundary conditions. So it's a little bit strange, but it makes sense when you think about it. So our wave function has to be single valued. So that means that you know, if I have a wave function from my rotational state, if my molecule is rotating around, when it comes all the way around the circle and makes a complete circuit, so it goes, it goes 2 pi rotation, it has to come back to the same place. And that just intuitively makes sense, right? You can't have something discontinuous happen to it as it's going around in the circle. And the quantization comes out of that condition because an integral number of wavelengths has to fit in that circle. So here's, here's how we would write that down. So some integral number of, of wavelengths has to, to go within that uh, circumference for the, our little point on the molecule rotating around the ring. And so that's where we get the, the quantization from. 
Okay, so here's the, the quantum version of uh, our angular momentum in the z direction. And what we get out of it is that it comes in increments of m sub l, which is its quantum number, times h bar. And m sub l can be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, et cetera. OK, so now we've described the z component of angular momentum. Let's look at this a little bit more. So the natural place to put this is in, is in cylindrical coordinates. And of course, r is fixed because we're talking about a diatomic molecule rotating. And we said it's a rigid rotor, so its radius can't change. It can't vibrate. It's stuck at that particular radius. So r just becomes a constant. That part integrates out. And so our Hamiltonian is simplified. And so now, here's how I write down that equation in Dirac notation. So again, if you don't remember what the wave functions for this look like, go look them up in chapter three. But instead of calling them psi, I'm just going to put that m sub l in the ket. And that indicates that I'm talking about the wave function for that particular m sub l value. And so if I write out the Schrodinger equation, you know, substituting in for what the Hamiltonian actually is, here's what that looks like. And I also want to point out that angular momentum and the angle are complementary values. What do I mean by complementary values in this context? Do you know? Is that uh, does that ring a bell from last quarter? Yeah. Um, you can't measure them with arbitrary <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, they're complementary in the sense of the uncertainty principle. So it's like it's it's an analog to position and momentum. You can't know the angular momentum and the angle. So they're complementary observables. And I bring this up because I wanted to point out that the um, there is a, a zero angular momentum state, and that's, that's legal. And that would seem to violate the uncertainty principle, right? Because we know the angular momentum with absolute precision there. It's zero. And this is a little bit counterintuitive when we have, you know, for people who are used to thinking about quantum mechanics a little bit. Because if you think about vibrational energy levels, or your, your harmonic oscillator potential, there's a zero point energy, right? Like you never have zero energy for that. For a rotational state, you can. You can have zero angular momentum. The reason for that is that in that case where you know the, where you know that with infinite precision, you don't know anything about the angle. It's just out in space. You know nothing about it at all. So that's, uh, that's why you're able to have a zero state for that. OK, so now we've talked about the z component of angular momentum. We have something rotating on our on a ring. Now what about if we have the particle free to rotate over a whole sphere? Did, did you do this last quarter or two? So you talked about the hydrogen atom wave functions. Again, everybody has seen those from general chemistry as well. So now we need to talk about the general angular momentum for a particle on a sphere. And I think we're not going to finish that this time. It'll be too rushed. So I'm just going to, to pick it up next time. Does anybody have any questions about what we did today? It's kind of jumping around between different topics, but there were some terminology things that we needed to clear up before moving on. All right, have a good day, and I will see you Friday.